Well, we were talking at lunch, we were talking just a little bit about, uh, you, you're not exactly a war correspondent, but you have spent a great deal of time in the Middle East, uh, you were in Bosnia, you've, you've had any number of... Uh, yes, okay, I mean, I see what you mean now, I mean, I don't think it's absolutely essential if you want to pronounce about, say, Iraq or um, Lebanon or Afghanistan. It's, people are entitled completely to their opinions of these things. But I think if you're, if you're in the business of writing and journalism, you do have a sort of obligation, especially if you are perhaps urging other people to go and fight there or urging other people to support them, going for, as I do, to go and have a look yourself and to expose yourself at least to some of this. I've, I've felt that as a, a kind of journalistic and moral commitment so that I, I can tell you if, you, if you want to know a little bit about what it feels like in Kandahar as the night comes on, or in uh, northern Iraq, um, or in Lebanon, uh, what it felt like in Sarajevo to see a European city being bombarded round the clock uh, by the Serbian army and so forth. The big difference, in case you wonder, is this. Very often when you see things like that, it's a bit like your first sight of the Berlin Wall, I remember. As I was crossing it, I thought, I've seen this before. I've done this before. I've done it on CNN. Or I've done it in some movie or, or some <coughs> Graham Greene novel. Everyone's done this. It's an almost creepy feeling. Mass media makes everyone feel they're present. They've seen the mass grave being unsealed. They've seen the city be bombarded or the refugee camp be uh, filmed. But the, I'll tell you what makes the difference. Because um, you have seen a lot of it and you have heard a lot of it. It's the... We know where your children go to school. <laughs> um, it's the smell. It's the stench. That's what tells you whether you're in a refugee camp or a mass grave or a bombed out city or a... But there's also a special smell of being <coughs> living under a di dictatorship, I think. Yeah. A sort of stench combined roughly with sort of residues of tear gas and sheer fear. We used to discuss in, in Saddam Hussein's Baghdad whether the fear was something so thick and strong and palpable that you could eat it or cut it and take it away in slices or just taste it. it was, but it was a, a thing, it was a physical quality. You can't get that if you don't go and see for yourself. John Lennox, mathematician, scientist, what drew you to that field? I suppose, in one sense, good teachers. <coughs> I had two very good teachers of mathematics and one very good teacher of languages, so I was attracted to both of those um, very early on, I suppose. And I was hoping to be an electrical engineer because I've always been interested in gadgets. And I, I was a radio amateur and used it to learn languages. And um, so I was going to do electrical engineering, but my headmaster told me one day, he said, I think you've a chance of getting to Cambridge, but only if you do mathematics, because we haven't got the teaching power. So that's how I ended up doing mathematics. And you spent a number of years, where, give, give us a sense of your resume, where you've been, uh, most recently, obviously, Oxford, before that, University of Wales? I, I started in, in, in Cambridge, and then I got a fellowship to study at West Germany, and got the language and uh, almost immediately started traveling, nothing like your travels, but to Eastern Europe in the, in the, in the Cold War period. Um, because it's interesting actually just to see what it was like to talk to people who'd grown up under Marxism and communism and so on. So I know Checkpoint Charlie extremely well. I've been through it many times and spent over 20 years traveling around in vacations, of course, and over the weekend, which I frequently did, in Eastern Europe. And then when the wall fell, and I helped a little bit to knock it down because I couldn't stay at home and watch it, so I went. I traveled to Russia, um, which language I'd learned earlier to translate Russian mathematics into English and spent quite a bit of time, particularly in Novosibirsk, Akadim, Gorodok, uh, discussing with people. So that's been one of the kind of major interests in, 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 in my life. But I ended up in Oxford, where I've been for the past uh, 12 years or so, and with periodic um, 
sallies forth to Birmingham, Alabama. I should add, for me, uh, as Oxford was my university and was also for a long time my family home. The thing I envy perhaps more than anything is not just the ability to speak another language properly. I, I can speak a little French and some Greek, but to <coughs> speak people properly, but particularly the universal language that I'm told is mathematics. Mathematics is a language on its own. If you it is, yes. meet another mathematician, you can do it. My, my father-in-law is a theoretical physicist. There's a, there's a lingua franca of people. Of that, that can, I'm very... I feel very disabled as an internationalist in, in lacking that dimension. My father, who was in the Royal Navy all his life and traveled around the entire world in the service of His Majesty, did predict to me that English would one day be the universal language. But he said, as it was, everyone really secretly understood it, if only you spoke it loud enough to them. <laughs> they were really pretending not to understand. Did you ever consider a career in the Navy yourself? Uh, by the time I was old enough to think about it, and every son of a naval officer who's been brought up on Navy bases, Navy brat, as you say here, obviously thinks about it. My father wanted to talk me out of it. He said, don't do it. By the time you get there, it'll be nothing but um, bloody submarines. Uh, he didn't say bloody, actually. But, uh, <laughs> and he thought that was no life for a gentleman. And so it's turned out the British Navy now is basically a coastal defense force of small vessels and, and two or three very large um, submerged Polaris submarines. It's not quite what it was. I'm sure many people have read about your most recent experience in Beirut. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Some of you may have read in the paper that uh, he was attacked. Uh, just what would it be, maybe two weeks ago? A Valentine's Day, mm. to be exact. Yeah, I can remember. Uh, tell, us, uh, tell us what happened there. The, uh, the, you've all heard the expression, the Arab street, haven't you? you uh, okay, I mean, everyone has. It's, a, it's part of the, the idiom of the, our discussion of the Middle East. The Arab street is not a one-way thing, uh, as, I, as I've found several times. Um, in Lebanon in particular, the, the largest crowds you can pull in Beirut, the largest political movement that exists in the country, is, is in a sense pro-Western, pro-American, anti-Syrian, uh, very strongly anti-Syrian, anti-Iranian, anti-Hezbollah. They, they want the independence of Lebanon back. They don't want the parties of God sponsored by other countries dominating their affairs. But there is a, there is a hidden hand manipulated by Damascus, by the Assad regime, that has two parties that work for it in Lebanon. One is Hezbollah, it's very well known, the Shia party of God, and the other is called the Syrian Social Nationalist Party. It's an extreme nationalist, irredentist, chauvinist group, mainly Christian Orthodox, as a matter of fact, that wants a greater Syria, comprising all of what's now Syria, all of what's now Lebanon, Palestine, Cyprus, and half of Iraq, an imperialist party. And its symbol is the swastika, which is a bit of a giveaway, I always think. <laughs> and um, after going to a huge demonstration of the March 14th movement, the pro-Western, pro-Hariri, pro-American, pro uh, anti-Syrian movement, I went shopping with some friends on the main street of Beirut, Hamra Street, in the afternoon. And there was a swastika symbol in front of me. So I, I take the old-fashioned view of this kind of thing. Swastika symbols are to be defaced. So I took out my felt tip and defaced it. And with appalling speed, uh, the guardians of this party, the honor guard of this fascist group, were on me, uh, trying to avenge the insult, trying to take me away cram me into the boot of a car, take me to a secret prison, which is what can happen, in, in, can still happen like that. In the, it has happened to friends of mine. And resolved that on no account would I let that happen to me. Anything would be better than that. Um, I had a, a bad experience in the street until, uh, here's the nice bit, the, the people in the, I was defended by the two friends I was with very bravely. and. The people in the neighboring cafe came out and said to the, these thugs, fascist thugs, what are you doing? I mean, what, what is this? This is outrageous. And that gave us enough time to get away. So it shows you how it's very vertiginous in the Middle East. Things can change on a dime. You can be at one moment in a huge, happy, democratic demonstration of Lebanese independence, and the next minute you can be having the leather put in by some ghastly group of um, pro-Syrian paid assassins. So everything's on a knife edge in that region. I, I guess that bit you already knew. And you're, uh, you're recovering well. 
Yes, I'm not limping anymore, and they didn't—they kicked me everywhere, but not in my head. So I didn't—I didn't really need any serious medical attention, and um, like it could have been, and has been for others, a great deal worse. John, you have—you uh, mentioned before you spent a great deal of time in in Eastern Europe uh, back in the uh, the Cold War, and though you've never, to my knowledge, you've never gone through anything quite like that, you have been followed by the KGB, and they you're. Uh, uh, bugged and uh, your hotel rooms and things like this. Tell us a little bit about some of your experiences in Eastern Europe um, prior to 1991. Well, <clears throat> I've never been set on quite like that. I've been had an ugly mob with knives come and again was rescued by people. I shouted in Russian, very wide straight in Novosibirsk at night and I was trying to help somebody who insisted on going out on her own. And I said, this is not wise, but I came along and sure enough, we had a, a group of young people, possibly high on drugs, I don't know, and the knives came out and you could hear them. And I just shouted across and told the people to stop. And they stopped and a crowd gathered and they melted away, but it could have been very ugly. Um, but the, the, the bugging and so on is something that you either put up with or you go home and you don't travel. And one, I'll tell you one story, though. i never forget. Uh, it was quite a lot in East Germany because I spoke the language. And I often went to what used to be called Karl Markstadt. It's now Chemnitz. And it was a huge Soviet-style hotel, but they always put me in the same room. And when you opened the door, there was a terrific flash of electricity, you see. And then you went into the room, and after a delay of about 30 seconds, the telephone started to hum. It was a very crude thing. And I was on my own. The subtlety of the city. It, it was immensely <laughs> subtle. But one night, I just couldn't sleep. And this thing was humming just by my ear. So I picked it up, and very politely, I said, good evening, gentlemen. I said, you know, I actually want to go to sleep. And I suspect you might want to go to sleep. Now, I don't really think I talk in my sleep, but even if I do, I'm sure it won't be the remotest bit interesting. So why don't we just have a truce and we all go to sleep? And they switched it off. <laughs> Probably. But I think the funniest one, this is perhaps a news, Christopher, is when I was in China, um, just a few weeks after the Tiananmen Square incident, so it was virtually empty. I was in a vast hotel, and <clears throat> I was sharing a room with a, an American friend, and I, I leapt into bed, and I'd forgotten to clean my teeth, and I just said out loud, oh, blow, I, I, I haven't cleaned my teeth, so I got up and cleaned them, I went back to bed, and about ten minutes later, there was a knock at the door, and as I opened the door, there was a smiling woman who bowed and said, toothbrush, sir? <laughs> <laughs> Her thought of a, a, an unwashed and untoothbrushed mm. Irishman mm. going to sleep without uh, overcame the fact that she was revealing that she'd been listening to every word that we'd been saying. And they say the South is good at hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. But those years were very interesting, and I formed many friends. I usually went as a guest of the Academy of Sciences, and. It's been very interesting just to watch the developments over the years. Christopher, um, future book projects. I'm, uh, my publisher wants me to write my memoir, which is what I'm doing at the moment. So <coughs> I'm having to realize that um, how treacherous memory is, in particular how when you start to unpeel it like an onion, you find, you thought you knew what you were going to say, but then you were reminded of things you've completely forgotten. It's, it's very intriguing and sometimes extremely alarming. Um, Elaborate. Yes, and, that's, and so that's where, that's before you uh, begin to wonder what you can tell about anyone else's story. It's just when you're talking about, about your own. Tell us a little bit about it. I'm, I solicit that this question is, is for both of you. Tell us a little bit about what's taking place in, uh, in the UK with the rise of, uh, of Islam in that, in that country. It's not the rise of Islam, I would say, as so much as the capitulation of civil society uh, without a fight, without an argument, to um, 
Islamism, if you, if you will. I mean, uh, uh, taking the most extreme demands of the Islamists as if they were mainstream. I'll give you an example. Um, there was a huge debate recently about whether or not um, women in uh, Britain should be allowed to wear not the shador or the um, just the scarf, the headscarf, uh, but the all-enveloping veil which only allows a slit of this kind. And whether and this, well, we should yes, we should allow it because it's Islamic. And because the Quran calls for women to cover their head. Now, the Quran doesn't call for women to cover their head. There's no such call in the Quran. There is probably only one society in the region, now that, now that the Taliban has been removed, namely Saudi Arabia, which calls for women to have their faces covered. If you went out like that in Turkey or in Tunisia, for example, you would actually be arrested. You're not allowed to do it in Muslim societies of this kind. Yet in London, it's considered that the most extreme must be the norm, lest we be accused of being insensitive to Muslims. This is the way the ratchet gets turned. Um, a, an elected member of the Netherlands Parliament, <coughs> Michael Gert Wilders, was recently arrested and deported at London Airport and sent back to Amsterdam because he'd made a film criticizing the Islamization of Holland, which is being a campaign of, of violence, uh, uh, including the murder of Theo van Gogh, the descendant of the great painter who'd made a, a film about the oppression of Muslim women in, in Amsterdam. Um, our Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. Rowan Williams, a man who does an almost perfect imitation of a sheep in human form. <laughs> An early objection of mine to Christianity when I was at school was being told that I was a member of a flock. <laughs> I don't know how you chaps and chap -esses feel about this. I always felt flock was a bit much, although I know some people of whom it could, could be said. But shepherd, look, we know shepherds don't look after sheep just because they like them, okay? Um, they either want to or fleece them, <laughs> or eat them. Um, the whole thing has always seemed to be a terrible, you'll forgive the expression, I hope, but that one has to come out with it. That's how Rowan Williams is to me. And he says that he thinks that the United Kingdom should have Sharia law for Muslims. No Muslim had demanded this. No Muslim imam had yet felt strong enough to dare demand that there be Sharia law in, in Britain. But the Archbishop of Canterbury says, well, let's make nice. Let's give it to them before they ask for it. Let's cry before we're hurt. Let's concede before it's even been demanded. This is a civilizational question to me. And it must be resisted. John Lennox. Well, I sympathize with that entirely. Uh, one of the things that has always struck me is just the accepted imbalance that we allow mosque after mosque to be opened in Britain, but try to open a church in Saudi Arabia and see what happens. There's no quid pro quo. And I actually, when I arrived in Atlanta, I turned on the TV, uh, CNN, and the first person I saw was actually Christopher. And I was very alarmed, not at what he was saying, but at what he was speaking against. And that was the notion that there was a serious motion before the United Nations that saying anything critical of Islam would be criminalized. And that's the end of free speech, and it's very dangerous. But perhaps you want to comment on that, because I think you're probably much more astute. The, uh, UN, than the I United am. Nations non -binding, <coughs> so far non-binding resolution, which is carried now for three years, and was carried again this week, sponsored by Pakistan, a country for which we pay. It isn't really even a country, barely even a state. It's a construct of Muslim partitionism carved out of the body of India. It wants to tell us what we can say and what we can think in our own country. And it says that we mustn't uh, ever use the word Islam in any sentence that includes the words violation of human rights, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, this is in the week when the government of Pakistan has handed over to the Taliban its most fertile valley, this valley of Swat, 100 miles from the capital of Islamabad. <clears throat> and said, you can run this valley, militarily and legally. You can have Sharia law, and you are the police and the enforcers. Of it. And you can close all the girls' schools. But we can't say that your religion is anything to do with the violation of human rights. It's preposterous. Your point about the one-way street is very well made, if I may say so. Um, th there are madrasas in, within 50 miles of where I live in Washington, in Virginia. 
There are Saudi paid for schools that preach violent anti Semitism, a hatred of the Shia Muslims. Remember, don't ever forget, they hate other Muslims too. Uh, of Hindus, of Christians and Crusaders, and of course of atheists. So they've got me, what, three times, I suppose, in this, <laughs> in this uh, field of trial. Um, and don't um, worry, it's coming to a place near you. Um, the Qurans that are given out in our prison system to Muslim prisoners by Muslim chaplains paid for by Saudi Arabia are Qurans written to the Wahhabi tune. They're not just your everyday Quran. They're the Qurans that the Wahhabis want you to read, containing direct incitement. They've been given out with taxpayers' money in the prison system. Militias are forming. Next, you'll have militias of this kind with their own chaplains within the United States Armed Forces. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to have Wahhabi preachers in the U.S. Armed Forces? You better get ready for it, unless you're going to take the James Madison view that there shouldn't be any chaplains in the U.S. Armed Forces to begin with or in the prison system. People want to pray, you can't stop them. But we cannot have state-subsidized prayer. We cannot have state-subsidized preachers or chaplains. Give it up or give it to your deadliest enemy and pay for the rope that will choke you. This is very urgent business, ladies and gentlemen, I beseech you. Resist it while you still can, and before the right to complain is taken away from you, which will be the next thing, you will be told you can't complain because you're Islamophobic. The term is already being introduced into the culture as if it was an accusation of race hatred, for example, or, or, or bigotry, whereas it's only the objection to the preachings of a very extreme and absolutist religion. Watch out for these symptoms. They are not just symptoms of surrender, very often ecumenically offered to you by men of God in other robes, Christian and Jewish and smarmy ecumenical. These are the, these are the ones who hold open the gates for the barbarians. The barbarians never take a city till someone <coughs> holds the gates the open gates. for them. And it's your own preachers who will do it for you and your own multicultural authorities who will do it for you. Resist, resist it while you can. And if you wonder what will happen if you don't, look and see how a cricket team in Middlesex in England had to change its name by force last week because it was called and had been for years the Middlesex Crusaders. Look and see how stories about little pigs can't be taught to children in English schools anymore lest offence be taken by the religion of peace. Resist it while you can. Has Britain lost its identity, its traditional a distinct identity, or is it just fast becoming incorporated into a, uh, into a, uh, a monolithic Europe? Well, it's lost me, I've become an American. <laughs> yeah. But it could probably survive that. Um, I dare say the old country can uh, stand the loss. <clears throat> it has a, there's a masochistic style that's becoming increasingly common, but there are, there are encouraging signs of uh, pushing back against this nonsense as well. But there is, an, an, uh, there is far too much political correctness, wouldn't you agree? It's Very certainly. interesting, there was a survey done just last week where people were asked on the street, did they think that the festivals, the Christian festivals, that's the traditional Christian festivals, should still be celebrated in England as a so-called Christian country? And the statistics were fascinating. Of the Muslims interviewed, I think I may have got the statistics wrong, so don't hold me to them. You can Google them. 76% said, yes, you should keep your traditions. The Hindus, 74%. The Christians, about 56%. Now that tells you something. It's funny how the fish rots from the head. I mean, we mentioned the Archbishop of Canterbury, <coughs> caving in on Sharia. The Prince of Wales, the chinless, bat-eared, <laughs> elder son of Her Majesty the Queen. A man with no taste in women, as far as I can see. Uh, the whole job is waiting for his mother to die. Um, will, on the, when, that, when Her Majesty's heart ceases to beat, will on that, at that instant become head of the state, head of the armed forces, and head of the church. A faith. This is what you get if you found a national church on the family values of Henry VIII. But it's not as we did, and he says that he wants to be not just head of the Church of England, but head of all faiths. Country, and with King Fahd of Saudi Arabia, has built a gigantic Wahhabi madrasa mosque in North London, where were housed the man in whose honour you have to take off your shoes every time you go to the airport, Richard Reed, 
well-known overnight guests there. They were housed two or th uh, four, I think, of the 9-11 hijackers. Uh, a pest house in the, in the middle of London, paid for by Saudi money, and uh, enjoying the, the patronage of uh, His Royal Highness Prince Charles. Uh, uh, it's a trison, a very high-level trison, by, by those whose responsibility it is uh, to safeguard and to uh, uphold what we used to think were the same values. They've sold, they've sold them out in an attempt to show how friendly to Islam they can be. Yes, uh, Charles has said he will no longer be the defender of the faith, but the defender of faith. Um, you know, Christopher, when I hear you talk about this, and, 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 uh, and forgive me if I'm mistaken, but you always sound to me just slightly nostalgic for a church that actually stood for something. Is that a fair assessment? Well, it, I suppose I'm a, the kind of atheist I am is, an, is a Protestant atheist. If that's <laughs> <what I mean. laughs> You, you, you could make of an honorary Irishman on the basis of that statement. You, you laugh, but I, actually I know someone, I know a, 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 was a Jewish friend of mine stopped at a roadblock in Belfast in the bad old days, and that thing you don't want to be pulled out of your car at night with, with, with face masks and guns and say, who, who are you, where are you from? He <laughs> says, well, are you, are you a Protestant or a Catholic? Said, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm an atheist. Said, are you a Protestant atheist or a Catholic? <laughs> <laughs> Unamusing when the, the gun has been ground into your ear. George, George Orwell says, uh, who's one of my favorite authors, says that um, in the plot of 1984 is essentially, it seems to me, the plot of the Protestant Reformation. That, that there was a secret book that was only in one vernacular, available only to the inner party, the, the, Latin, the Latin Bible, in other words. Um, and that the, the struggle is always to get the, this book translated into the, into the vernacular. Well, it can be, as the 39 articles of the Church of England put it, understand it of the people, to remove it from the arcane, from the recondite, from the, uh, um, so that the, the tradition of the Enlightenment and of the Reformation is, is, inspiring, is an inspiring one, yes, even to someone who doesn't have any faith in any supernatural uh, provenance. We'll have to save some of those, some of that uh, um, for, for this evening. Should, yeah. Let me let me ask you uh, this question. You you make reference to the fact that you are now a naturalized uh, United States citizen. What moved you to do that? Uh, well, a number of things over the years, uh, including uh, perhaps very crucially, the First Amendment to the Constitution. You see, none of these sellouts, or the Establishment Clause, to be exact, or the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, was none of these sellouts that the British Establishment has inflicted upon the people of Britain in the face of Islamism would be legal in the United States. You couldn't be allowed to do it. You, you can't be nationalizing someone else's church or allowing other people to have separate religious courts and, and all this kind of thing. And, you know, it would be out of the question. It would be flat out unconstitutional. And as I'm a, I'm a biographer in a small way of Thomas Jefferson and... Um, even smaller way of Thomas Paine, I'm very interested in the, in the founding and in the Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom and in the, in the way that the United States became the only country in the world that can claim to have real confessional freedom. That means a lot to me. So I was Americanizing myself over the years um, and my children were American and um, so forth. But it was really after 9-11 that I began to feel I was sort of cheating on my dues if I didn't change citizenship properly. I mean, I, I could have gone on forever with a European Union passport and a green card. I had a platinum green card, in fact, one of the ones that doesn't, one of those ones that's so old they don't run out, they need to be renewed. But as the argument went on over Iraq, over Afghanistan, and people were, the New York Times would report there's an American view of this and a European view, rather crudely in both cases, because of course there are many Europeans who are pro-American and many Americans who are pro-European, but you know what I mean. To the extent that those terms had meaning, I realized I was taking the American view of them and willing to defend it, often willing to defend it where, if I can say this, um, the administration didn't seem very good at doing so for itself. I wouldn't say public diplomacy was the highest point of the Bush administration's faculties. I hope I don't offend anybody. Um, wish I'd never heard the name Karen Hughes. Oh, never mind. There we go. go. Um, <coughs> I, d I identified more and more, and because also, because I was arguing at audiences that often included members of the military and others, that, that there should be a fight, and that I was prepared you know, to go there myself, and even if only as a witness, 
to it, that probably the way to adjust that seriously, properly, was, was to become, take out the papers myself, identify fully. So you guys may feel very patriotic, and gals, as you should, but you'll never be able to feel as patriotic as someone who did it on purpose. I said, you should envy me. I have a feeling you can't have. I'm very proud of it, too, if I may say so. And so, my fellow Americans, <laughs> it's taken me a long time to get to be able to say that, and you've no idea how good it feels. Thank you for having me, by the way. Very nice of you, too. Can, can I ask you a question, Christopher? By As someone means. who's still a Brit, <laughs> you yes. see what I mean. I'm very interested in what you say about the First Amendment. Do you feel there's any danger in this country of people losing the meaning and the reason for which the Founding Fathers actually had that amendment. Oh, well, Mark Twain makes a wonderful remark about the Bill of Rights. He says the United States is, a, I can't remember precisely how he phrases it, but he says they have you know, all, the, all the pride in the uh, existence of this Bill of Rights and all the discretion not to uh, overuse it uh, or to insist upon it too much. I mean, that's because it's a birthright. People don't understand what they get for free. That's why I think it's important that moments arise. In my life, it was when, almost exactly 20 years ago, when uh, an attempt was made to suborn murder um, in the case of my friend Salman Rushdie by the theocratic head of a foreign state, offering money in his own name for the murder of a novelist, a bounty, who wasn't an Iranian, who lived in London and was trying to write fiction. And I thought, well, this is a pretty frontal attack on the idea of free expression. And I was interested to see how many people thought, yes, but do we have to uh, make a big thing of it? I mean, maybe we've offended the Ayatollah. Maybe we shouldn't have upset the Muslims. Wait, wait, what, what? It, it only comes, it's only going to come once maybe in your entire life. You get a chance to witness for what the Founding Fathers cared about. Free expression trumps everything, um, all other considerations. Interesting to find out that it has to be fought for and renewed each time. Privileged to have taken part in it. That's what I mean. Um, there are still a lot of people who are embarrassed <coughs> by this kind of thing. But, uh, it may or may not be coincidence, but almost all such cases have to be upheld against theocrats or those who charge blasphemy. I mean, ever since the trial of Socrates, through Galileo, Voltaire, Others I can think of, Rushdie and others in our own case, Ayan Hershey Ali, many others. It's against theocracy, against those who know they're right, who claim the divine uh, uh, ability to tell you what to think. And but it's not necessarily against people who have faith in God. I mean, looking back at my own history, I can imagine that if I'd been alive when they set sail to come to America, I'd have been sailing with them. Because in my own Christian tradition, it was the very one that was being oppressed by the official church. So it wasn't, it wasn't that there were no people of faith in God. It was, I think what you say, a theocracy, which is a rather different thing. Yes, but the, the, the claims of faith are um, uh, involved on both sides of this until the First Amendment. I mean, when, if you look at the famous letter from the the Baptists of Danbury, Connecticut, to President mm -hmm. Jefferson, seeking his, beseeching his protection of them. They, feel, they don't feel welcome where they are. They, they want the reassurance that the, 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 uh, there'll be no official sanction given to religious bigotry or religious tests. Okay? Everyone knows the letter, I, I hope. Okay? Who, are they, who, are the Protestants, who are the Baptists of Danbury, Connecticut, afraid of? Why are they so worried? Of whom are they so scared that they feel they have to write to the president seeking his protection? The Congregationalists of Tamari, mm. Connecticut. That's who they're afraid of, who don't consider them to be Christians, mm. who don't consider them to be citizens, who don't consider them to be kosher, if you pardon the expression. That's what they're seeking protection from. So the, there's only one solution to this. The state doesn't allow any faction to feel that it has state support. Otherwise, there would be the chaos and misery that led to what happened in Europe in the Thirty Years' War or in the uh, cousins to the south of us, south, uh, in, in Central America and elsewhere. But it doesn't... It's the only one, only, only possible answer, which means that the Office of Faith-Based Initiative, all of these things are flat-out unconstitutional. The state cannot even notice 
what one church is doing or saying. It may not even know. It's not allowed to be informed what is happening there. And the taxpayers, no taxpayer's dollar can, can leave the treasury in the direction of any church for any reason, whatever. Not once, or the whole thing is ruined. Uh, and no I, one, no one, who, un no one who understood the importance of it would, mm. would if it's only those who don't realize how lucky they are who are watching this being trampled and defamed. I, I think you're exactly right on that point, Christopher. John Lanks, would you like to make a, uh, a comment here? No, not at all. I mean, I, 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 I mean, the way I read that is it was to defend free expression for everybody and not favor one particular group. That's what Jefferson consulted the Attorney General before writing the letter. He thought it was so important. Mm. Well, let me ask you. Let me ask you a final question. But state question. by state, in those days, it was okay. You could say this is a Congregationalist state. If you're a Baptist, you're lucky. We, we, we might tolerate you. <laughs> you're tolerated, but you're not really allowed. If you were in Baltimore. You'd better be a Catholic. If you were in Georgia, it said you had to be just, all it said was a Protestant. It didn't say what kind. In New York, you could be Jewish in, and hold office in Rhode Island. I think you couldn't. It was complete chaos until the Constitutional Convention. Imagine what could have happened if it were not for the Virginia Statute mm -hmm. on Religious Freedom and its enshrinement <coughs> in Philadelphia. Imagine what kind of United States you would not have had. John Lennox, uh, final question. Uh, future <clears throat> projects for you? Books? Well, I, as you are well aware, I'm very interested in, I've always been interested in the, the in atheism as a worldview, and I suppose I would like to write, I've started writing something not simply on the science and God question, which I've already written about, but more generally. I uh, would imagine that Christopher knows my home country well, and having grown up in a sectarian country, with very fortunately uh, parents who were not sectarian, I, I think one of my objectives is to defend true, what I consider true Christianity against being confused with the kind of horrendous and evil sectarianism that Christopher describes so well in his book. And I would want to make a case that there are real differences and they need to be considered. So I'm writing on atheism, the new atheism. That's one of the things I want to do. And that will be, what, a year? Um, how, how long from now when that's available? Well. I haven't got this man's gifts as a writer, so I never predict. I can't write to deadlines. I find they paralyze me completely. That's funny, I can't write without them. Yes. <laughs> well, there speaks a real journalist and a real writer. Well, gentlemen, we want to thank both of you for being here. Oh, sorry. Uh, we're looking thank you forward to the event uh, this evening. I think you'll, uh, many of you already know, uh, John Lennox is very engaging, always a delight to, uh, to hear him. Uh, Christopher Hitchens, you will agree that, uh, that he says a great deal, that it's hard not to listen or to read um, what Christopher Hitchens uh, has to say, very engaging. I find myself agreeing with Christopher on, on almost everything except perhaps when he comes to uh, my own faith and possibly sheep. So uh, I, uh, I think he says a, a great deal that's, uh, that's interesting, and you won't want to miss them uh, this evening. They will, again, they'll be at Samford University, 6 p.m., um, this evening. I think we have some tickets here, and they are $20. So Sanford has uh, given us an allotment of I don't know how many, but that, uh, that, that go directly, they, that'll save you from queuing up there if you don't already have one. So just. Michael said they're the $30 seats. They're the $30 seats. And uh, so I guess you can just go to the back of the office for those. You can also find a DVD of these gentlemen the previous occasion when they debated back there, and you'll find their books. Here. So what we're going to do is we're going to put Christopher over here uh, in my office where he can have a seat and you can queue up and get your book signed by him if you'd like to purchase one or if you brought one. John Lennox in the back of the office uh, to, to do the same and by all means help yourself to any tea, coffee or uh, and any one other point, that are And one point if I may on mutton and lamb. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, day, the other day on the BBC, I had to debate one of the Archbishop of Canterbury's juniors. I've forgotten his name. He's a canon <coughs> at St. Paul's. And I made my flock point. And he said, in a rather bleating way, <laughs> he said, you know, that's a very interesting point. 
<laughs> because I used to have to be the bishop's special assistant to the Church of England in Papua New Guinea. I'll stop trying to do his bleating voice. And as you, as you know, in most parts of the world don't have any sheep. I mean, most parts of the world sheep are unknown. It's another way you can prove that the New Testament is strictly a local event. Um, those of you who care about the mores of Bronze Age Palestine can care if you like, but it's, there's no universality to it, especially because of the sheep factor. He said what they had to work out for their sermons in Papua New Guinea, what was the most prized local beast? And he said this ended up in him hearing his bishop get up on the pulpit on Easter morning and addressing the Christians of Papua New Guinea and saying, oh Lord, behold thy swine. <laughs> Well, you couldn't just sit there. You see. <laughs> well, it's a, Chris, Christianity is a very local event, believe me. Thank, Thank you God. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks. <laughs>